they do grow high, and the leaves they do grow green. A hundred years ago, a musician with a powerful sense of mission was rushing through the Somerset countryside. Cecil Sharp was determined to save what he saw as a disappearing heritage. Those whose pictures and music he wanted to record before it was too late were ordinary people who held in their memories the extraordinarily rich legacy of Somerset's folk songs. The singers. I made my love a shroud with the Holland so fine and every stitch I put in there the tears came trickling down oh once I had a sweetheart but now I have got never one so Thanks to Cecil Sharp, that lovely old song from Somerset has passed on to me and to a new generation of music makers. Concerned that traditional music was becoming associated only with rural life, with the old, the out of date and the redundant, Sharp collected nearly 5,000 songs and brought a dying tradition back to life. He helped to make young England aware of, and proud of, its musical heritage. It all began here, in the Vicarage Garden at Hambridge. What happened here exactly 100 years ago today is seen as so momentous that this tiny Somerset hamlet is organising its own special day to celebrate it. Cecil Sharp's visit to the vicarage here is seen as one of the key events in the history of English folk music. Sharp was on a visit to an old friend, the Reverend Charles Marson, who had assured him that he couldn't have hit upon a more unlikely spot to find a genuine folk song. Yes, it looks to me as though he's exactly the kind of chap who... Um... During this discussion, the gardener was mowing the vicarage lawn in front of us. And I hazarded the conjecture that very likely we might get something out of him if we tried. What, John England, the gardener? Yes. I, I wouldn't mind betting I can get something from him, you know. Well, give it a try. My friend at once remarked that he did sing a song that was rather pretty, called The Seeds of Love. I accordingly went to him, at once entered into conversation with him, and in a few minutes, with the aid of a pipe full of tobacco, I extracted this song from him. I sowed the seeds of love And I sowed them in the spring I gathered them up in the morning so soon While the small birds did sweetly sing While the small birds did sweetly sing Immediately after he had noted down the seeds of love, Sharp began to work out harmonies and his own piano accompaniment to the tune. I sowed the seeds of love, I sowed them in the spring. He wanted the songs to be heard and to be made available to a wider audience. And the way to do that at the time was to publish them in books and the way to do that was to provide piano accompaniment and to, to perhaps tinker a little with the words. While small birds did sweetly sing. He took songs from people. Songs can be very, very personal. They can be an, an expression of that person's whole life experience, they can be very meaningful in terms of the memories that they have of who sang them or, or when they were sung. And he doesn't seem to have had any concept of that in the way that he treated the arrangements of, of the songs. But I had not the liberty to choose for myself 
his drive to get the last of the songs before they died out really overcame everything, the relationship with the person, the view of the song. Sharp's encounter at Hambridge was the starting point for a frantic search throughout Somerset for songs and singers. If the old songs which are still being sung by the peasantry of England are to be preserved for the benefit of future generations, they must be collected without delay. There is an immense amount of work to be done, far more indeed than most people imagine. Here's to my shirt, my jolly, jolly shirt. My shirt have seen better weather. For the tailor is torn out and the sleeves are looking about. And the cold has sticked up for finer weather. Louis Hooper, a widow who lived near Hambridge, was an outworker in the shirt making trade. It was a hand to mouth existence, work coming and going as the local economy rose and fell. Louis was to become one of Cecil Sharp's richest sources of folk songs. Mrs. Hooper. Hello, sir. Good Hi. morning. One of them, Here's to My Tin, which means Here's to My Money gave cheerful expression to the ups and downs of a life close to poverty. Here's to my hat, my jolly, jolly hat. My hat have seen finer weather. For the crown it is torn out, and the brims are looking about, and the lining stick it up for finer weather. Here's to my tin, my jolly, jolly tin. For I spend it all my tin with the lasses drinking the gin and across the briny ocean I must wander Here's to Imagine their joy when the collector calls upon them and tells them of his love for the old ditties. He has only to convince them of his sincerity to have them at his mercy. And the collar stick it up for finer weather Did Cecil Sharp exploit the singers that he met? Folk song experts disagree. He had a very single-minded attitude to collecting. In other words, he went there to get the songs, and when he'd got them, um, there wasn't really much room for conversation, except for some exceptional people. He'd just talk about emptying people of songs. Copyright, it did become a source of income for him. It's also about his wish to control the form that things went out in. I know some people say that he exploited them. I don't honestly think he did. He did his best to develop a, a friendly relationship with them and I think he was respecting them. I have to take these shirts down the Oh, allow me to come I with you. I think he made a little bit of money. He wasn't a rich man. I don't think he exploited the singers. He genuinely wanted their songs to be sung and be made available to a much wider public. And how many of those shirts do you make in a week, Mrs Hooper? Quite a few. Sir. Certainly, Louis Hooper did not feel exploited by Cecil Sharp. Quite the contrary, according to her grandson, Bill Adams. Well, I think they got on wonderful, didn't they? I mean, he gave her the concertina, he took her to almost a fair, he even gave her some... I think, I think he gave it a tin whistle and a, but I don't, I don't know where that went. Wish I had it now. No, I have no Sharp idea. collected nearly a hundred songs from Louis Hooper and her sister. She remembered him warmly for the rest of her life, especially their day out together at Ilminster Fair. You certainly get a good life you six foot here. <laughs> By giving them a bit of time and attention, Sharp persuaded some of his Somerset singers into becoming enthusiastic supporters. But others were to prove a damn sight more difficult. Sharp's meetings at Hambridge set him off on a hunt throughout Somerset for songs and singers. It's on the farmer's daughter, so beautiful I'm told. Heave away, my jolly, heave away. Her father died and left her 500 pounds in gold. 
My mania of collecting in my beloved Somerset is still unsatisfied. Five hundred pound in gold, heave away me John. The bulk of the songs, the biggest, biggest lot of songs he collected in Somerset, something like 1,500 of songs. Somerset, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, there were a lot of isolated communities. Um, and I think the, the more isolated the community, the more chance there is, I think, of people retaining their oral tradition and their oral culture, and the songs very much part of that oral culture. Sharp now saw himself as leading a major folk song revival. His most prolific shanty singer was to be Yankee Jack, John Short, who made his living as a hobbler, helping ships move in and out of Watchet Harbour. It's on the farmer's daughter, so beautiful, I'm told, heave away. His voice was rich, resonant and powerful, and yet so flexible that he can execute trills, turns and graces with a delicacy and finish that would excite many a professed vocalist. Away, me bonny boys, we're all bound away. The point of revival was to transfer folk song and later dance from one class to another. The folk were seen as failing. They were elderly. No one was interested in what they did around them, so who would, who would pass it on? Who would it be passed on to? And so the point of the revival in Sharp's intervention was the idea that you needed to give the songs back to the nation. And to do that, um, Everyone had to be involved, but clearly the people who were most interested in it were middle class, who were sort of encouraged to take part. John Short loved to sing songs of the sea, and it's easy to see why. For me, the reason that sea songs are so evocative has to do with the people that wrote them. The sea represented, at the time, untold possibilities. It represented great adventure, the great unknown. But for the women that were left behind, it also represented a sense of loss and knowing that your true love was out there in the unknown and not knowing what was going to happen to him or if he was ever going to come home. For a jolly sailor I adore Just as the tide was falling Between the hours of ten and eleven My love, she asked me to bed to come for I said silence gives consent to my love's chamber bed. I went, I was Hi. up to the exams. Despite his posh private school background, Cecil Sharp had a keen curiosity about those on the fringes of British society. The middle classes in the Edwardian age tended to regard gypsies and Romanies with suspicion, even contempt, but not Sharp. Betsy Holland, who he first caught up with at Simmons Bath near Minehead, represented potentially a rich source of songs to add to his collection. Good afternoon, Mrs. Holland. Um, I understand that you know some lovely old songs that you learnt from your grandmother. I wonder whether you Sometimes he didn't know what he was letting himself in for. One of Betsy's favourite songs was about a prostitute who stole from her customers. <laughs> Betsy Holland, Rebecca Holland, he was, he was very taken with her singing. And yes, I think that was, that was giving a, a gypsy singer, a gypsy family, respect, recognition that, that I doubt if they had otherwise. I think he had a genuine affection for the songs. I think he had a genuine affection for the singers. And I think he had that attitude 
of, of benevolence and, and fondness for the working classes. Mrs. Betsy Holland is one of the finest folk singers I have ever come across, and I shall not readily forget the impression which her song made upon me. Cecil Sharp wasn't always a welcome visitor. Gypsy husbands didn't look kindly on posh men who took an interest in their wives. It wasn't only jealous gypsy men who took against Cecil Sharp. As a personality, Sharp is a really difficult man. I, he, he, argumentative, chauvinistic, snobbish, tremendous snob, um, hypocritical. He, he, he made rules for other people that he then didn't apply to himself. He always rowed with the people that he worked with. He liked to work with inferiors and him to be in charge. Whenever he worked with, with people who were sort of his equal in age and status, there were always arguments and everything went horribly wrong after a while. Sharp even fell out with his old friend, the Reverend Charles Marson, and increasingly preferred to carry out collecting and photographic work with uncritical supporters or on his own. Nevertheless, he maintained good relationships with those he saw as his singers. These were not rich people. Harry Richards was a strapper, a casual agricultural worker, certainly not a wealthy man. And there he is treating these people with the greatest respect. I made my love surround with the marlin so fine And every stitch she put in it as well as the songs, Sharp developed a remarkable collection of photographs of those who sang them. Thanks to him, ordinary men and women who would have been long forgotten will now be remembered forever. Most singers were flattered by Sharp's interest especially so those at the lowest level of Edwardian society, the paupers forced to live in a workhouse. He found local workhouses especially fertile ground and visited a number in Somerset and Wiltshire. My mania for collecting is still unsatisfied, so I am at the workhouse. There is so little time to be lost. The old singers are dying out rapidly, and I shudder to think of the ruinous effects which a severe winter would have. Some of Sharp's followers tried to outdo his collecting zeal. One of them, rebuffed by an old lady with a song that he wanted, hid under her bed whilst her granddaughter persuaded her to sing. Girl upon his knee, oh don't you think that's a grief to me? In 1904, Sharp published his pioneering work, Folk Songs from Somerset. It was the first major step in what was to become his lifetime mission, saving the songs of England. 4,977 songs. That's an enormous legacy. All of us, even these critics, I'm quite sure that they would agree that the, the legacy of the work that he did, you know, forget the publishing stuff, just the collecting work, it's phenomenal, phenomenally important. The anchor will weigh and our sails we will set. Goodbye, fare thee well. Goodbye, fare thee well. The friends we are. I think without Sharp's drive and determination and single mindedness, 
the way that we see folk song in England now would be very, very different. He was a man who shaped attitudes, ideas, and indeed the form of, of folk song. And in that sense, he was enormously influential. I believe so sincerely in the innate beauty and purity of folk music that I am sure it cannot really be contaminated, but that it must and will always do good wherever it finds a resting place. The name Cecil Sharp to me conjures up somebody that I owe a great deal to. The most important thing is that he did not destroy the originals, that he actually kept, he kept everything. So that if you can find something to love about a traditional song, if you can, if you can find something that speaks to you, then you can sing a folk song any way you want. And we can have a, a chuckle at the, the genteel stuff. I'm going away and I say 